missing Dubai. Hope you're well then. So this is it. Welcome everyone on this leadership webinar, the seven best practices for coaching and feedback conversations for highly effective leaders with none other than Mr. Bob Dignan. I highly appreciate you all for taking time and joining with us today over here. My name is Savan Kumar Arya. I'm in Dubai and I'm with Imaticus Learning, one of the fastest growing education technology companies in the world. I would like to invite Mr. Suresh Rao, the co-founder of Imaticus, to take it over from here and give us a brief about Imaticus to all. Thank you. Suresh, just to say you're on mute, Suresh. I would like to invite Mr. Suresh once again to give a brief about Imaticus and introduce us. Thank you so much, Mr. Suresh, for joining. Thanks, Avan. Uh, great having you all here. Uh, I think, uh, as Bob said, it's nice and warm out everywhere. Uh, but I guess this is going to be more warmer session in terms of the learning that uh, Bob will kind of bring here. So hello all, I'm Suresh. I'm part of the co-founding team in Imaticus. It's been 10 years into the journey of Imaticus. And... Uh, we specialize in the area of finance, analytics, technology, and very importantly, soft skills, leadership, and behavior. Uh, we were primarily headquartered out of India, and importantly, for the last five years, we are in the Middle East region. Dubai office is a hub and spoke model. Out of the Dubai office, we run various programs to our clients across the region, you know, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. Uh, from an Imarticus, uh, we build deep expertise in providing uh, corporate training programs, which is absolutely customizable across the spectrum from banking finance to new age fintech, data analytics. Uh, interestingly, data analytics is not just from a concept point of view, but application-based analytics program, for example, HR analytics, sales and marketing, risk analytics. Um, we run technology programs right from cybersecurity to cloud engineering. Uh, to full stack dev uh, and concept of DevOps is something that we do day in, day out. Uh, digital marketing is something that we specialize in, especially in the last four years, the, the advent of social media has kind of propelled the overall space of digital marketing. Uh, but more importantly, from a today's contest, uh, you know, you know, we are proud to uh, bring in fierce conversations to the Middle East and North Africa market. Uh, I know there are enough and more leadership-based programs that is run across our space. But I think when we went closely uh, working with fears, we understand the value that fears conversations brings in. Um, I think as simple as a communication being a most important part of any corporate uh, space, but it is the most underserved in our opinion. Um, I think the, the topic that comes across today uh, in the relevance of, of uh, basically you know, coaching and feedback, I'm sure a lot of you have gone through some programs or the other, but I think what fears conversations and what Bob will bring in is, 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 is something more, uh, shows a particular dimension that we all need to look at. Uh, so fears, and uh, that is something that we are proud and I'm sure we will have a lot more conversations uh, on that particular topic. Uh, across this board, we have built clients. Uh, we work with Mashrik Bank, the first Abu Dhabi Bank. Uh, we work with HCT Engineering College, one of the top colleges in, in Dubai. Um, and I'm sure that uh, these are some of the names that is coming in. Uh, but I'm sure if you are absolutely looking for some specific programs on areas right from what Bob will talk about or if there are other programs that you would like to kind of have a chat on, uh, please reach out to Savan uh, who will kind of then work out a solution around that. That's a quick about Imarticus. Um, I, I think uh, you know, Bob can introduce his best uh, with his own self uh, because it's kind of rich experience that Bob carries. Uh, but we are truly excited to have Bob in here, and I'm sure the next one, one and a half hours will be truly engaging uh, session with you all. Uh, so good luck and best wishes, uh, and uh, thank you so much, Bob, for helping us get this. Thank you very much. So welcome, everybody, to uh, yeah, what we're calling Seven Best Practices for Coaching and Feedback for Highly Effective Leaders. Um, I will start with just a very brief introduction to who I am and the kind of where I am, so you have a sense of context. 
Uh, where I am, I'm actually based in the north of England, uh, 300 kilometers north of England, uh, north of London, uh, 200 miles. Uh, the company I work for and represent as a director is York Associates, um, here today uh, representing in partnership with Imarticus. The mission that I have had personally for the last uh, 20 years has been to enable professionals operating internationally uh, to develop effective communication skills with the understanding that operating internationally is a particular area of complexity which requires particular behavioral adaptation, attitudinal adaptation, as well of course as working in a foreign language for many of you, although not for me. So that's been my speciality over the last 20 years. More recently, um, I've been working with a, within an organization called ILP, focusing specifically on leaders. I would say that's for the last 10 years. And within that role, and within the role that I occupy now, probably 70% of my work has been coaching, executive coaching on a one-to-one -one basis, and 30% training. In my free time, I also try to write books on the topic of international leadership and international communication, and also working outside the corporate sector from time to time in the academic world, uh, in business schools, on master's programs, master's of project management, master's of B, uh, MBAs. The advantage there is that you get insights into research, into these topics, which we call leadership and communication, realizing that they are incredibly complex. There is very little academic consensus about what good uh, leadership is, what good communication is. So today it's um, very much not lecturing to you, but sharing my own experiences, my own perspectives and trying to say something a little bit new, something a little bit different, because I think we have in the room people who are trained coaches, probably have practiced coaching uh, for a long period of time. And of course, feedback as a, as a phenomenon, you cannot not give feedback in front of another human being. The moment you stand and start to listen to somebody or you speak at somebody, interpersonal feedback begins. So, you know, the moment you live, feedback is not a choice. It is mandatory. So we're all experienced with these things to some degree. We all have assumptions. Uh, today, my role is probably to make you think about some of those assumptions, just to, to help you think maybe in new, more creative ways about these things that we call coaching and feedback, which hopefully can help you, but of course help the people that you are giving coaching to or giving feedback to. In terms of the, the focus of the playbook that I want to unlock a little bit, I mean, you can look at many different dimensions of coaching. Uh, you can look at it institutionally, how you plan a structural coaching. You can look at the practicing process itself, how coaching is delivered and trained, uh, how it's monitored, and then how it's continuously improved. So, I mean, coaching at the end of the day is a, is a business process. I'm going to narrow myself to the, to the nuts and bolts, you know, what you do when you're sitting in front of somebody. And as I say, try to think a little bit creatively and non-intuitively about coaching and feedback, and also bring in what was mentioned by Sawan, this concept of fierce. Fierce conversations, of which I'm a, a trained master practitioner, is a kind of a body of knowledge. It's a, it's a set of tools um, which I think are very valuable, not very well known outside the US, and that will be part of the session today to bring you into familiarity with the work of fierce conversations. Check out the book later and I will mention it as we go through. So seven principles, that was my mission, uh, which I had uh, presented to me by Imarticus. I came up with these um, and I'll walk you through them. Get the fundamentals right, uh, explore impact, respect fear, uh, integrate the system, uh, make language central, uh, be careful with emotions, and simply enable the next conversation. None of those are transparent, of course, uh, but that's the whole point, to kind of reveal some things that I do, perhaps that uh, others don't think about so explicitly. Um, but they do represent, uh, I think, important elements of my, my own practice, which I find uh, deliver uh, results. And at the end of the day, coaching and feedback exist not for themselves, they exist not even for the purpose of learning uh, in the corporate sector, they exist for the purpose of performance enrichment, which at the end of the day drives sustainable profitability, uh, sustainable relationships, retention, sustainable organization. Um, so I hope that these proven, at least in my world, principles can help you in your world. 
So let's start with getting the fundamentals right. Actually thinking, what, what are we talking about? We know the words coaching and feedback. Um, and of course, they're both fundamental to leadership today. Uh, Tom Peters made this quote in the 1990s that the fundamental objective of leadership is, is not to lead per se, but it's actually to create uh, more leaders, to build sustainable organization. In other words, to develop other people. Uh, so the idea is that uh, coaching and feedback are essentially organizational developmental activities. And there is actually a lot of evidence, uh, you can find it yourselves relatively easily, that organizations with a strong coaching culture seem to perform better. And that uh, feedback, when it's given uh, well to employees, um, employees respond positively. Either they, they show more initiative individually or they collaborate more effectively. So it's a kind of a no-brainer that coaching is good, uh, uh, feedback is good. Um, but does the story stop there? Not really, because I still think there are lots of very, very fundamental misunderstandings about coaching, particularly among leaders, not so much among the practitioner community, which is trained, but among leaders understanding what coaching is and, and, and how to coach. Um, this is a little article. Again, I will give you references to all of this. Very powerful claim that only two in 10 managers know how to coach. Um, and actually, if you go to a, a source of knowledge such as Wikipedia, you see the, the misconceptions that exist about coaching out there in popular understanding. And I think Wikipedia kind of reflects, if you ask most managers what coaching is, particularly those who have not been trained, they will, they will give you these misconceptions, that it's about training, that it's about advising, that it's about guiding. And I think uh, even the coaches that I work with, they come to the table very often expecting me, the individual, to offer the way forward to give the correct answer. Um, my own kind of response to that is that, you know, we need to remind ourselves where coaching comes from, that it comes from the world of therapy. And that at the end of the day, coaching for me is an attitude. It's an attitude that informs how you talk to somebody. It informs why you talk to somebody. And it's based upon the belief from Carl Rogers that at the end of the day, people have within themselves a huge kind of source of resources. Um, if they can tap that resource, if they can escape the assumptions which are sometimes imposed on them by their organizations, uh, by training partners, or even by themselves, that with the right psychological kind of framework, the right psychological attitude represented by the coach, myself, people can become inspired, people can become creative, and people can find new ways forward. That fundamentally for me is what uh, kind of coaching is all about. And of course, it then leads to certain sets of behaviors, uh, namely asking more questions rather than telling, because the role of the coach is fundamentally to inspire self-reflection and a process of self-discovery. That may be a given among the coach community. It is certainly not a given among the coachee community. And one of our major roles as practitioners is to make clear and to legitimize exactly kind of what we're doing. And this uh, is an example. Um, Fierce Coaching itself defines itself in exactly this kind of co-active tradition, developing others to generate and embrace uh, their own solutions. What about feedback? Well, is, is feedback so misunderstood? That perhaps is, wouldn't you expect it to be a more, a more obvious term? Uh, let me take a couple of leaders, uh, Elon Musk and uh, Bill Gates. Um, let's look at what they say about feedback. Elon says, I think it's a very important to have a feedback loop where you're constantly thinking about what you've done and how you could be doing it better. Bill Gates, this is a very often quoted uh, statement. We all need people who will give us feedback. That's how we improve. Now, embedded in those statements from very prestigious and very successful people are a number of very deep misconceptions about what kind of feedback is that firstly, um, good feedback uh, focuses mainly on mistakes, that you're looking to improve, to correct somehow behavior which is failing. That is an assumption about feedback which is heavy uh, in many people's minds. Secondly, that the notion that when I give you feedback, when a person gives another person feedback, they are saying something which is truthful. They are saying something which is accurate. They are saying something which is correct. I mean, that, is, um, that needs to be challenged. 
because um, if we assume that what I'm telling you is in some sense correct, um, immediately I begin to point out myself as the owner of truth, yourself as the recipient of truth, and immediately we begin to create a psychological dynamic in which defense mechanisms grow. The third uh, misconception um, is that there is a universal perfection to strive for. In other words, that there is a correct way to do things. There is a correct way to listen. There is a correct way to run the meeting. There's a good way to present uh, to the board. Um, all of this, um, these three conceptions produce a sense of fear, uh, that uh, feedback is essentially predicated on criticism, uh, on correction, and disempowerment. Um, and that is why um, I think 65% of employees, despite the fact that um, uh, everybody recognizes that feedback should be constructive, it is not happening. I meet almost zero organizations which claim to have a feedback culture. I meet almost zero individuals who say that they receive enough feedback. And that I think is because people often fear to give feedback because they know with these assumptions, they step into corrective territory that breeds defensiveness that can easily escalate into conflict. So the feedback giver becomes reluctant, becomes hesitant with these assumptions because they know the task is difficult. How easy is it to give criticism? And the feedback giver, hey, who wants to be criticized? Um, the feedback getter uh, basically then thinks, I don't really want to open myself to feedback because I don't want to be told what I'm doing wrong. So these assumptions basically lead to neither the feedback giver giving feedback or the feedback getter asking for feedback. So what are then the correct assumptions we should bring to the table about feedback? Firstly, it is simply a process to share perspectives. I will stand in front of you as another human being and I will say something like, I saw this, I heard this, I felt this. What do you think? I simply share uh, a perspective. It is a moment at which uh, I may, as the feedback giver, learn as much about my cognitive bias as the feedback receiver will learn about themselves, their personality, their competence. In other words, it must be to succeed fundamentally perceived as a two-way process of learning in which there is kind of a democratic distribution of power. It is also a conversation utterly and totally and comprehensively focused on affirmation and growth. For me, there is no such thing as negative feedback. It is per definition an oxymoron because that is not what feedback is. Feedback only, uh, if it is to be called feedback, is about uh, enabling people to grow um, and enabling people to understand what they do well already. It, curiously, feedback is a time when listening is much more important than telling. You know, you ask people what feedback is, and they very often will start their definition. It's about telling somebody that, that telling is, is the core of feedback, the transmission of somehow information to another person which they're unaware of. The, again, if you work with that definition, it simply begins to fail because you get into the no, it didn't, no, I didn't. Uh, that isn't an accurate representation of what is happening. So feedback, like coaching, paradoxically, fundamentally depends much more on asking than telling. Feedback is a process of uh, smart questioning rather than um, smart telling. And this is extremely important as a final definition for my own side of what feedback is. You don't need to accept it. Um, somebody can tell you what they saw. Somebody can tell you what they felt. But at the end of the day, they are simply telling you about their world. It is not truth. It is not accurate. And you have the freedom to reject it and say, A, I see the world differently. B, I don't accept uh, your perspectives. I don't accept your projections. Um, I believe that the way I'm doing things is legitimate as it is. The moment you give choice, of course, to the feedback receiver, then they will step in. Uh, they will not resist feedback. They will willingly hear the perspectives because feedback simply becomes a mechanism when I don't learn about myself as the feedback receiver, I actually simply learn more about the feedback giver. Uh, and that is always useful information. These are kinds of things I often discuss at the beginning of kind of coaching or feedback rounds, 
because once these expectations are set, um, people begin to embrace these processes much more positively uh, and proactively. Interestingly, Fierce as a body of knowledge and Fierce uh, Conversations was a book written in 2003 by the inspirational Susan Scott. You can find her on YouTube talking about radical transparency. Um, we'll talk about her during this, the session today. Um, inspirationally, she says that any conversation, feedback, um, coaching, small talk over dinner tonight that you have with your partner, your friends or your kids should ultimately have four objectives, four objectives alone. You know, all conversations at the end of the day should be learning opportunities. They're not data dumping my truth on your reality. Fundamentally, conversations should always be in the space of interrogating reality, asking questions, trying to uncover the blind spots that you bring and, and try to bring onto the other person. Uh, that conversation, interaction with another human being, fundamentally is about provoking learning. It's about creating openness. It's producing benefits in that respect. It's also about tackling the tough challenges, talking about the things perhaps that others don't talk about. That's, of course, very much the domain of coaching and feedback. Usually the difficult topics come into those types of conversation. That goes to the heart of uh, Susan Scott's philosophy. And her observation is that human beings don't talk about the tough challenges. They procrastinate. They avoid. They sugarcoat messages. It's only in the coaching and the feedback moments that the tough things get talked about. Her claim is that we should be talking about these things much more often. And the underlying purpose, perhaps the core purpose of any conversation, should be to enrich the relationship. You know, you walk away from a conversation, the other person feels better about themselves, they feel better about you. Um, I remember meeting a Russian guy once in, in Poland on an MBA program, and he said his philosophy of communication was always to leave a conversation with the other person having a smile on their face, just feeling a little bit better about themselves and the, and the world. And again, that feeds in not just into coaching and feedback, which are developmental, but also into any conversation. So that's a little introduction to part of the core of Fierce. If that interests you, pick up the book. It's a very interesting book. So those are the fundamentals. Then um, drilling down a little bit, I think coaching and feedback focus very much on two core areas. Um, behavioral impact, the impact of your behavior on others, not so much personality, not so much kind of psychological complex, that may be more the world of, of therapy perhaps, but on behavior and on the opportunities and on the risks that uh, your behavior brings for yourself and brings to other people. And just as a way into that, I'm going to show you a, a short video. It's a video that I have used probably for the last 20 years in, in training and in, in coaching. And it's three minutes. Uh, and I just in invite you to watch the behavior of three people as they introduce themselves at the beginning of uh, a project, at the kickoff meeting. Martine will say a few words of, to, about herself. Manfred will say a few words about himself. And Phil will say a few words about himself. And I want you just to think. Uh, you can note down what you think, because that's also interesting. And I would ask you to consider the feedback that you would probably give to Martine, Manfred, and Phil. OK, so that is going to be uh, your activity. You're going to watch this very short video now um, and you're going to think about the feedback that you would give to um, Manfred, Martin and Phil. Just three minutes and then we'll uh, discuss um, how I classically use this. So let me share the screen again. Uh, sorry, let me just need to share the sound. And then I introduce you to the wonderful world of Manfred, Martin, and Phil. So I'll play the video. It will take a few minutes to, to, to start and then just watch, watch a note and think about the people. Well, Martin, um, would you like to start? I'm Maratin Gonzalez, I'm 35, and I am the project manager in charge of the B2B side in Mexico. We've had some great successes in this area and I look forward to sharing them with you. I'm married to Ricardo, 
And we have two lovely daughters. Here they are. I guess I'm pretty outgoing. This is the first time I work abroad and I'm really excited about it. Is that enough? That's, uh, that's fine. Thank you, Martine. Um, Martine and I met last year in Mexico at the Zoom meeting. Uh, perhaps I can just uh, say uh, one or two words about myself. Uh, my name is uh, Stolmeier, uh, Manfred Stolmeier. Uh, I'm the uh, research and development director of our laboratory in Mainz. Um, I've worked in this industry all my life. Um, um, I have a doctorate in biochemistry. Um, I started working for Bracken 10 years ago uh, and have always worked on the product development side, which is why I've been asked to lead this project. Um, Phil, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, my name is Phil Chu. Uh, I was born and brought up in Malaysia, but I studied in the UK. I only recently joined Bracken as project manager, responsible for the veterinary products in the Southeast Asia zone. Um, we feel we are making good progress in our market. I have some slides here to show you on our latest product launch. Perhaps, uh, perhaps not now, Phil, but uh, thank you anyway. Yeah. Um, Beth, what about you? Uh, let me just stop the share. Um, yeah, let me just invite you to uh, chat for a second. Um, maybe you want to share a few thoughts um, about what you just uh, witnessed. Um, share your perspectives in the chat spot, uh, chat box, and yeah, just what do you what do you think? What do you, what do you think about what you just saw? So Paul, just telling us three very different styles. Yeah, very nice. A lovely smiling up going. Very excited, the assignments. Well, just mind if there are lots of eyes. Okay. It's very important that you, that you kind of share your thoughts. Manfred, concise to the point. Martin, much too much personal. I don't know about credentials. Martin was outgoing. Okay. Different than some what was expected. Okay. Phil was not confident, okay. Too much alpha male from Duane, okay. Phil started with we, okay. Lots of smiles, so it went into many details. Phil obviously wasn't brief, cultural difference back. Phil underconfident, okay. Um, that probably caused by the smiling, actually quite cold from Manfred, yeah. Too much personal information from Robin, okay. Shared unnecessary details, okay. Okay, interesting. Okay, just give you an underconfidence. Sorry, Phil was experienced. I think it's a brick. Okay, interesting. Hossam's comment is very interesting linguistically because it's a little bit different to everybody else's. Um, new faces, so hit nervous. Um, it's interesting because the, the word I want to thank you for that. And it's great to see all the comments going through. Um, but I want to share probably the, the feedback. I mean, it, it's interesting because when I ask you to give feedback, we come back to the, you know, uh, the question of what, what, what is feedback itself? The first response that um, um, what I noticed when I show that uh, video to people is uh, and it's almost without exception in terms of geography, kind of culture, age and professional background, is that um, people are generally quite critical. People look at these three people with very little context and will say things like, Martine is too personal, shouldn't show photographs in that kind of meeting. Manfred is a bit kind of cold. Uh, he fronts up his expertise and experience far too much that's not modern leadership and Furley's a bit nervous shouldn't be showing those slides um, um because that's not the time and place to show that and he, he feels a bit nervous that's that's the common frame that human beings use to give feedback to others either internally in their head um, they might even share that as leaders with their team members my first response and the response i would encourage you to think through as a, as a coach, as a feedback giver, and as a leader particularly, is to use one word. And the one word is a very simple word, just three letters, wow. What amazing talent. 
We have Martin, five years in B2B in Mexico, lots of success. Um, she arrives at this meeting. She says, I'm willing to share, um, highly kind of collaborative. She's willing to be vulnerable. She says it's her first project. Uh, she uh, arrives uh, with a lot of commitments, so very excited. And the holy grail at the end of her introduction, is that enough? Asking for feedback. Manfred, how does he start? He validates Martine because he knows people might see her as a bit nervous. Then he knows that she's new, Phil's new. So what does he do? He tries to calm things down uh, and says, don't worry, I'm expert. I'm experienced, 10 years in this industry. I've got your back. Don't worry. This project is going to succeed. And by the way, I was asked to lead this project. The sponsorship is under control. Very good relationship with the senior management. I know this organization. I know how to navigate the project. And Phil, hey, he lived abroad in the UK, uh, UK educated. Um, so he has a kind of an international experience. He's also delivering great results already uh, in KL, in Kuala Lumpur, where he's relatively new. So he brings fresh insights to the company. And hey, he wasn't asked to prepare those slides, but those slides demonstrate a very important quality. He is highly proactive, doesn't need to be micromanaged. This is a guy is going to fly. You might need to control him from time to time, like Manfred did, very politely, Manfred. He said thank you. In his own terms, he was trying to be polite. But as a, as a, as a group of people, we have the emotional, we have the analytical, we have the action-oriented, all the evidence indicates if you've got diversity in a team, you have the potential to high perform. So that is one way to view the video. That is one way to view life, uh, in fact. And um, that's a mentality. That is a choice uh, in terms of how you live your life as a leader, as an employee, as a coach, as a feedback giver, you know, whichever position you have, you have a choice how you view people, how you view their potential talents, uh, and how you choose to interact with them and communicate about them. And that's, that's a kind of an exercise I do a lot because it, it confronts people with a very stark choice. Do I wish to be judgmental or do I wish to engage with people on their, on their own terms and not demand that they are like me? That's a, almost a kind of a fundamental. Then we come to coaching and feedback. Um, uh, and then we come to um, really how do others see you? I mean, I would say to Martin, I saw you introduce the, the photographs. I felt very empowered by that. I felt, felt very excited. Then I would ask the question, how do you think you impact others with that behavior? And then we entered the myriad of human perception. Some people will be inspired by that. Some people will be disappointed by that. Some people will be frustrated by that. Some people will be confused by that. Some people will be switched off. They will view you as incompetent, unprofessional, and they will begin to doubt the project. In other words, coaching and feedback is not about saying how people are. It's about impact. It's about getting people to think about how other people view them through their prejudices, through their cognitive biases. And then we come to the final question, well, which other ways could you conduct yourself in order to manage that perception, to manage that motivation, and to get to where you want to with that person? With the choice to stay authentic, to stay yourself, um, maybe explain your way of doing things to the other person so they kind of understand it. They still may not accept it, but you still may take the choice to be who you are and live with the consequences of that. That for me goes to the foundation of what I would call coaching and feedback, um, understanding yourself, understanding how others see you, and then taking a decision how you decide to interact with those biases, those prejudices, those intolerances, to use a kind of a provocative language. Um, and if we look at the, the tools that Fierce has developed, Fierce feedback and, and Fierce coaching, I think they live that kind of philosophy. Uh, the feedback model is based upon three phases. Explore what happened, the experience. Explore what, what people think about what happened and then explain. So for example, you're asked to go through a process. Um, what was your experience of what happened? Be specific as, as though you're watching a video. So I will explain to you uh, what I saw 
what I felt, then I will ask. Notice feedback is about asking. What's true for you? What was your experience? How do you see this? Can you tell me what you thought was going on? I'm curious to see if, what, if you see what I see. I'm not demanding that you see what I see. I'm curious to see if you see what I see. So feedback giving is very similar to coaching. We're actually asking questions to look at how far the feedback giver and the feedback getter are aligned. And then we're into questioning again. What are the results if this behavior continues? Manfred, people may feel you're cold. They may disengage with you. Uh, Phil, people may feel you're insecure. They may not give you heavy responsibilities. Uh, Martin, they may not take you seriously. And then we begin to ask, what is the impact if nothing changes for them, for the team, for the organization? So at the heart of the fierce philosophy of feedback are exactly the assumptions I've talked about, building awareness of different perceptions and then exploring um, what you want to change in terms of impact, the consequences of changing, the consequences of not changing and how uh, you can change in an appropriate way. Um, and then you, go, you, you clearly go on to the next steps. And of course, from a leadership point of view, what can I do to support you? The fierce coaching methodology is also quite similar philosophically to this. Um, as always, coaching, it's, it's a kind of a process and we identify what's going on, but we're fundamentally fierce is asking, what is the impact of this situation? What's the impact of this behavior? What's the impact now? What's the impact in the future if nothing changes? So again, we're talking about impact. We're not talking about right and wrong. Uh, we're not talking about you being like me, you conforming to the organizational culture. Uh, we should be breathing diversity here and respecting different ways of doing things. We're, we're speaking about managing impacts. And at the end of the day, the, the fierce kind of coaching methodology is about describing an ideal outcome and essentially how to get there. So that's the first part. Uh, and ultimately, when you look at feedback and coaching, they're kind of the same thing but moving in slightly different directions. You know, when you're coaching, the, the idea, the problem, the scenario tends to come from the team member. Um, the leader of the team member tends to introduce the problem to the team member, but the two underlying approaches about interrogating reality, provoking learning, tackling something tough, and somehow building an impact which enriches relationships, that is common to both. So in a sense, coaching and feedback, two sides of the same coin. Thirdly, um, I, see, I see questions coming in. Thanks, Paul. We'll, I'll try and pick up these questions um, towards the end, if that's okay. Thirdly, respecting fear, a kind of strange language, perhaps. Um, but this, again, goes to the heart of the fierce conversation philosophy. I mean, the definition of a fierce conversation is in front of you now. A fierce conversation is one in which we come out from behind ourselves into the conversation and make it real. A little bit strange, but a fierce conversation is one in which we come out from behind the conversation, from, sorry, we come out from behind ourselves into the conversation and make it real. This highlights, of course, the phenomenon of masking and the recognition that we need to have as human beings that a major objective of communication is not to communicate. A major objective of human communication is to conceal, uh, not to reveal. It's to conceal our fears. It's to conceal what we don't know. It's to conceal a sense of shame. It's, con it's to conceal a lack of knowledge. This is a major objective of communication, which undermines corporate life quite significantly because people are going into meetings, they're having discussions, they're reaching decisions, and then as they walk out of the meeting and they walk down the corridor, they start having the real conversation. And, you know, we've all been there. We've all done that. And this simple call to action from Susan Scott, you know, be brave, come out, be courageous. Fierce is about being powerful and speaking out in a way which um, overcomes your own fears and tries to reach results. You know, Google, the philosophy of psychological safety, which it found was the major determiner of high team performance is based on exactly the same thing, creating an environment where people feel safe to speak. 
So in other words, we need to recognize the fears uh, that are within us, within us as human beings. And there are a number of fears. If we had more time, if we had a whole training day, we could go through some of these core fears which lie within all of us. Fear of uncertainty, fear of failure, fear of rejection from another human being, fear of becoming too intimate with somebody so we stay distant, fear of conflict and fear of authority, all of which are, um, are recognized very strongly within social science. What's interesting, and that's why I put the title that fear is a positive motivator, fear works for us. That's why we hold on to it. That's why we stay with it, because it delivers results, which therefore, in a strange paradoxical kind of way, fear is a positive motivator because something like fear of failure, what does it do? It drives very high performance. It drives perfectionism. Um, it makes us work extra hard so we don't fail. Of course, what that does is it makes us too demanding for ourselves, too demanding, too critical of other people, and it eventually leads to interpersonal conflict which then starts to um, uh, manifest in coaching and feedback conversations. So I think whenever you're coaching, whenever you're dealing with feedback, I think it's very important to introduce the language of fear early, inclusively. This is not about you and me. As coach, as feedback giver, I occupy this territory as much as you do because I'm a human being. But we need to make the language of fear very transparent, um, and very much part of our conversations, part of our solution. Fourthly, integrate the system. What am I saying uh, here? Um, this is because, let's imagine, um, I walk into a company, one of my clients, and I meet Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay has been given to me by his team leader, and Sanjay has a challenge. For example, he is coming across as too direct, therefore he needs a coach, he needs somebody, for God's sake, who can give him the feedback that will make him change. Um, we need to be very, very careful of that kind of mandate, which is often given to us as a coach and a feedback giver. We need to be careful of that perspective, which we may occupy as a leader. Because when you meet Sanjay, in fact, you're not meeting Sanjay. Um, very, most of the time, we don't meet people in professional life. Um, which may sound strange, we don't meet people because we meet their role. We meet them behaving according to a certain definition of key performance indicators or expectations about what it means to be successful. We generally don't meet the personality. We meet the cog in the wheel. We meet something which is part of a very long supply chain, um, which is deeply invisible to us in first contact, particularly as an external. So we need caution. And um, even if you're leading somebody in a team, there is also a very uh, uh, long supply chain uh, to think about. So in my world, the first thing I need to do when I meet Sanjay is not to believe him, not to, be uh, not to believe what he tells me, but to start to understand his boss, because probably his boss is having a huge influence on his behavior and defining what is seen as good and what is bad. And in fact, if I want to help Sanjay at all, I have to meet his boss. And probably the boss is not the stopping point because the boss is only part of a chain. The boss is only behaving like they're behaving because they have uh, an executive board, which is creating KPIs, uh, strategy for the country business unit. That All of that is influencing the boss, which is then influencing Sanjay, which is then causing a set of behaviors which may or may not make sense. The executive boards of companies, the CEO, the COO, the CFO, they themselves are not acting themselves. They are also operating within a system which is actually set by um, shareholders who have certain expectations of the organization, certain expectations of profitability. If a shareholder has an expectation of 5%, the, the board, the boss and Sanjay will operate very differently than if the shareholders have an expectation of EBITDA of 30%. That expectation drives everything within the system. Behind the the number of employees that a company has, you know, fewer, fewer FTE, fewer employees, better stock market gearing, better stock price. That leads to irrational behavior in organization. 
that irrational behavior, you know it by a better name, it's called outsourcing. Outsourcing demonstrates two things empirically, you reduce quality and you increase price. Why do companies do the illogical and the irrational? Because the analysts have a metric, namely that fewer employees on the payroll is simply what they want to see in order to back a company and to boost its share price. So at the heart of this system, uh, you have illogicality. And Sanjay, at the bottom end of the food chain, has to start working with outsourced IT, uh, outsourced HR, all of which deliver lower quality. What does he do? He tries to push harder to get the quality, which then triggers me to come in as the coach and the feedback giver. The source of the problem may not be Sanjay, it may be the analysts. And behind the analysts, there are, of course, customers' expectations, there are supply expectations, and there is a big bad world of macroeconomics with raw material prices, inflation, and COVID, all of which. So you know, whenever you enter the world of coaching, which seems a very private, interpersonal conversation, you are entering a huge and complex supply chain. And my impression of uh, coaches in general, and they are often representing the ICF, the International Coaching Federation, the world's major body, is that they stay way too interpersonal. And they, they exclude the systemic factors from their analysis and from their content. And very often it is the systemic uh, which um, has the source of the problem. It doesn't have the source of the solution, interestingly, because Sanjay cannot control. It's how to survive in imperfect systems. So that's the systemic perspective. Then to shift gear a little bit, um, yeah, but Bob, surely we, we, we need to talk about communication at some point, for sure. Um, most people misunderstand uh, what communication is and most people radically misunderstand the nature and the role and the difficulty of language. Um, have a look at these three very simple examples of language. What could be simpler? Great job. Have you finished the report yet? And let me take the lead on the presentation next week. Those look very, very kind of simple uh, examples of language. Um, they have all been sources of conflict uh, within my coaching and feedback conversations because what do they mean? Yeah, every word you say for the rest of your life is ambiguous and is likely to be misunderstood and is likely to generate um, uh, confusion at some level. Have you finished the report yet? Let's imagine uh, my coachee reports to me. My boss walked into the office yesterday and he said, have you finished the report yet? I was really frustrated. So in other words, have you finished the report yet? My coachee is interpreting as uh, hurry up. I know you haven't finished the report. I know you're slow. Please get faster. There is another meaning. It could be the boss simply wanted to know, is the report? No, you haven't finished the report. I'm just using this as a trigger for you to say no. And then I'm going to say, could I help you? And this goes, again, um, to the heart of language and to the heart of how we interpret other human beings. Um, language is fundamentally ambiguous, and we often interpret too quickly negatives in, in the way people are saying things and what they say to us. And a major part of my own coaching practice is to reinvent people's relationship with language and fundamentally to say you understand nothing of what somebody is saying to you. Start to doubt your own perceptions and give the person the benefit of the doubt. They're probably trying to say something positive. You don't hear that the first time. Go back to them and, and clarify. And just say that life transforming question, sorry, what do you mean exactly? That changes everything. You drill down, you get a little bit better common understanding and alignment, relationships can proceed. Let me take the, the lead on the presentation last week was said to my coachy by her boss. 
um, she was furious. She'd done hours and hours preparing the presentation. She wanted to deliver it. She wanted to shine in front of the corporate board. At the last minute, boss comes in and says, I'll do it. She thought that that was a lack of trust. Um, another example of micromanagement. I pointed out that it could be that there was an agenda of which she was unaware and the boss felt that he was better able to represent that political complexity with a very demanding stakeholder. It was a possibility. She accepted that and began to reflect less on his language and more on her negative bias. And then finally, I have to tell you the story of Gudrun, uh, my German client, who, when a British project lead said to her great job, became furious. And she said to me, I can never work with this guy again. Tell somebody what they can do better. You never give positive feedback. Uh, positive feedback is a waste of time because what you should do is assume that everybody will do a good job because I'm a professional. I'm paid. I will deliver. So when Gudrun heard great job, what she thought was the British project manager was surprised. He was surprised because he thought Gudrun wouldn't be able to deliver. So he said, good job. I'm amazed. Gudrun was offended by that because she, she felt the British manager should not have doubted her ability to deliver. <coughs> Do not underestimate the degree to which these misperceptions surround you. And I think one of the major jobs of, of a coach, a feedback giver, a trainer, is to reset how people understand language and to, to reinvent and to encourage them to begin to clarify more. Two final points, two short points. Um, number six, be careful with emotion. A question. This is a central concept in psychoanalysis. Does anybody know what you are looking at now? Does anybody have a one word which describes this picture? I use the term psychoanalysis because psychoanalysts and psychotherapists are very well trained in the, in the field of emotion, in understanding emotions and decoding and managing them. Business uh, professionals are radically undertrained in what emotions <laughs> are and how to handle them. So Charlotte, that's five words. There is a concept for what you're looking at here. And it's very, very important in coaching and feedback. Nice idea, Paul, it's not mirroring. Uh, that's more from neuro-linguistic programming. Uh, but uh, silver medal, I'll give you, Paul. It is the phenomenon of not self-reflection. Nice idea, Barges. That's a positive spin, which I like. You'll take silver, Paul. It is the phenomenon of projection, which is the idea that very often we criticize others uh, for things that we fear about ourselves. In other words, we criticize others for being unstructured when we fear to be unstructured ourselves. It's a way of handling the unwanted emotion about ourselves by outing it and criticizing somebody else. That is fundamental to understand because in a coaching conversation um, or in conversations in general, when somebody begins to criticize somebody else, you now know they're probably talking about themselves. That's a very important insight as a coach and a feedback giver. There are two other very important words from psychoanalysis, which I'm kind of predicting you don't know, transference and counter-transference, which again, very, very fundamental to understanding the world of emotion. Transference is the phenomenon that, um, um, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, therapists know that um, a client when you often has a feeling which they, they push onto the therapist and relive a past relationship. This is a phenomenon that the emotions that you have about people in front of you are often not about that person. You're actually reliving an emotion that you felt about your parent, your brother, uh, a past partner. You're reliving that relationship with the person in front of you. Most Many of the emotions you feel about the people in front of you are not about them. They're about your past. Um, and then you have the phenomenon of counter-transference, 
that the feelings you feel in front of another person are often about their transference. So that means the fe you're feeling something based upon what somebody is feeling about somebody in their past, which means your feeling is connected to somebody you have no idea of in the person's deep history, which means as a coach and a feedback giver, we are operating with very high complexity, a lot of unknown unknowns, and we need high, high sensitivity and a lot of kind of careful exploration uh, with emotions to understand what they mean at all, because very often it's not transparent. And we are generally as coaches under trained to deal with emotion. Finally, I would say my objective as a coach, as a feedback giver is very, very limited. All I am looking to do is to enable the person in front of me to have a successful next conversation with a person they are finding problematic. That is generally the scope of my ambition. And, you know, you think about it, that seems very limited. But at a certain level, our life is a series of conversations. That is how we interact with people. One conversation at a time. And at the end of the day, as a coach and a feedback giver, maybe that should be our focus, just, just to enable the next conversation to go well. You know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Let's narrow our focus to that and build upon the success step by step. Let's forget trying to change kind of large behaviors. Let's enable conversations. And that brings me full circle, and it's the final thing I'll say, uh, to Susan Scott because the central philosophy of life and communication is this, you're looking at it now, while no single conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of a career, a company, a relationship or a life, any single conversation can. And that kind of insight that any single conversation, it has the potential to be transformative. If we show up curious, interrogating reality, uh, trying to provoke learning, trying to talk about the difficult thing, and at the same time trying to build a relationship. If we can do that, we will inch our lives forward positively, uh, step by step, and we will enable others positively, step by step. And that's it. That is uh, my contribution uh, to coaching. From the fundamental reset, really down to all I'm doing is helping uh, the next conversation, the next email, because if we get that right, we can get the next one right as well. So I hope that um, provoked. I hope it gave some insights. I hope it made you think maybe I need to go away and think about fear. I need to go away and look at psychoanalysis. I need to go away re and, re and read Wittgenstein on the philosophy of language. And Susan Scott's Fierce Conversations, very pragmatic, very smart one conversation at a time, help yourself and help other people. That was it. Um, hope that was interesting and um, thank you for your very valuable time. Thank you, Bob. Uh, well, we have some questions uh, from the chat box as well. Uh, and we have some comments on the uh, question and answers platform as well. So Bob, would you like to Answer Rita, you know, when you were sharing a, a, a slide on, she felt it was a little odd to put a continent Africa under fear. So, yeah, I know that it is odd. And it's not, it's not, it's not my, it's not my, uh, my disclaimer is it's not my model. And I, I agree with you. It's in terms of diversity and inclusion, it's not the term that you would want to use. So apologies for that. If any offense was caused, um, the main message there was to engage with these fears and to recognize the strange paradox of fear, that fear enables us, it drives us to perform well, but it disables us at the same time. Um, so it's a really a, a double-edged sword, as we say. And I think we need to encourage our clients, our employees, our leaders to understand the fears that are driving them and to confront those. Great. Thank you so much for Bob. And uh, we have a question from Paul also. He mentioned that, how would you deal with this someone who constantly dominates a meeting and the chair is not dealing anything with it, right? It's especially with someone with whom you don't have a coaching or a feedback relationship. 
So first thing, let's come back to language. That word dominates. Uh, that, that term dominates is prejudicial. It is not a description. What you're saying is that person uh, empirically talks more than others. That is not the same as domination. So firstly, the first problem is in your head. If you're looking at somebody and labeling them as dominant, arguably the problem is with you, not with the person. <laughs> So let's start there. That, that Again, it comes back to our use of language and we need to describe very carefully what is happening and, um, and, and not label. Uh, secondly, secondly, one person talking more than others is, is not necessarily bad. That person may have more expertise. That person may have more commitment. So let's think less about the process, but also consider the outcome. Is the outcome optimal? Are we getting good results? Are we uh, uh, having a motivated team? I mean, maybe everybody's happy with one person uh, dominating the environment. Mm -hmm. Secondly, to be honest, the tool that I use uh, to demonstrate um, what is happening is a very simple tool. What I do is I do that. I don't know if you can see that. You can see that on a piece of paper. It is circles. At the end of every meeting that you have for the rest of your life, draw circles. Big circles represent people who talk a lot. Small circles represent the people who don't talk very much. And just ask the meeting, what do you think? Is this optimal? Do we need to change this? Um, and I would empower uh, the meeting group to define its own rules of engagement, which goes back to the philosophy of co-creation of culture and empowering people uh, to constructively give feedback to each other and to see, uh, to enable the person who talks a lot to see that they do talk a lot. Because inside the person's head who is talking a lot, they don't see that. So it, it comes back to feedback, encourage people to co-create. If they don't um, follow the rules, there are lots of mechanisms. Uh, don't invite them to the meeting. <laughs> um, ask them to speak last. Uh, have a clock in the room uh, with 60 seconds, for example. There are lots of mechanisms you can play with. First, it's awareness. And first, it's empowerment. And then if you need rules um, for outside stepping. Thank you, Bob. Bob, uh, we are going a little over time, but we have some great questions right now. So one is asking, I'm so sorry if I'm taking a little more time, but I think addressing these questions will help. Uh, and would be good. So, Bob, we have one question. How how does cultural uh, differences make an impact in our lives at work? Oh, that's a, that's 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 a whole other. Let's not, that's not just another hour. That's another day. Um, <laughs> so, cult, cultural differences. Let me be provocative again. Um, yes. Culture, just in your heads as you sit now. Give me one word. What is the opposite of culture? I'm hearing the silence. I'm hearing the uncertainty. Um, Paul, you get another silver medal because you're, you're, you're very proactive in the chat. <laughs> but that's not the right word. If you're an anthropologist, what is the opposite of culture? There is a word technically. It is nature. The wind, the rain, uh, the stars. It's the external world, which is independent of human meaning. And that is the problem with the word culture. Culture is so big, so abstract. Does it really help me to understand Duane or Barges or Paul? So be careful with culture. Most business professionals radically overestimate the power of, of culture in general. Um, and uh, also when you talk about culture, what people are actually implicitly talking about is national culture. He's from India. He's from the US. He's from the UK. Um, just to say, I work at the University of Reykjavik, and I can send you the research if you're interested. Contact me on LinkedIn. There was a lady who looked at the thesis, what is the impact of national culture on international projects? Very interesting idea. The conclusion of her research was there is no academic consensus about the meaning of culture. Um, B, there is very limited evidence for the, ev for the existence of national culture. India exists for sure, it's a political state, but to say there is Indian culture, the evidence is not there. It, it, India is too fragmented 
to say there is an Indian culture. You have one billion people. In the UK, you have 60 million. Um, Brexit indicated that it is a highly fragmented uh, society. So we can say there is British culture. That doesn't mean it exists. What we are generally doing is stereotyping. And thirdly, there is very little evidence for the impact of national culture on international project success. So the answer to the question is, you're asking a dangerous question because behind the question, there are some dangerous assumptions. And what may be much more important when you're trying to understand somebody's behavior, who is their boss? Who is the boss of their boss? And under which KPI system do they operate? That will tell you much more about their behavior than where they were born. Excellent. Uh, I think we'll take the last question over here right now. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's a question like, uh, you know, of course, coaching and feedback is very relevant to the people who are at the higher positions in an organization. But how does a person who's uh, at a mid-level or a junior level uh, and is responsible in the learning and development industry or functional area, how does that person come back, uh, you know, among the experts uh, for delivering coaching and feedback sessions or to have that culture in the organization? What do you say? What, what do you have to say to the junior uh, learning and development specialists? Well, the, the interesting word in your question was the word junior. Um, because again, there are assumptions there about what is senior and what is junior. How useful is experience? Um, because coaching is based upon the concept of I do not need uh, content experience to be a great coach you know the qualities that you need are much more personality driven in terms of empathy control patience the ability to intuit and to ask a good question and in, in the training that i do we often do a mini session on coaching and i have seen people with zero experience of coaching uh, conduct transformative conversations simply with a short introduction to the fierce model go away and do it with a total stranger for the first time in your life and trust the process. Follow the process, follow the kind of the questions, listen sensitively, and you can achieve a lot. So for those who feel inexpert, in a strange kind of way, inexpertise may be your, your advantage because okay. it will bring openness to the conversation. Well, thanks a lot, Bob, for addressing these questions. And thank you everyone once again to join us today for this session and uh, I've got some great comments and I can see some comments, uh, you know, great. Thank you so much. Everyone is appraising and Bob, uh, thank you so much once again for uh, giving a great lecture on the seven best practices for coaching and feedback conversations. I hope everyone enjoyed. Once again, uh, if you would like to get in touch with us, my email ID is already mentioned. I'll just put it once again. It's savan.arya at imaticus.com. I'm in Dubai. Uh, we have an office over here with more than 15 centers in India, which is Imaticus Learning. And uh, Bob is one of our master uh, facilitators and practitioners who helps give uh, training on various leadership development uh, topics. And uh, once again, I would like to thank all of you to take your time and uh, join us over here. And if you would like to get in touch with us, email us. You can call from our website. You can take the number or I'll just mention over here as well. And uh, if you would like to collaborate for any kind of training, learning and development solutions, or if you just want to see the uh, exhibition of our uh, training solutions, just pick up the phone and get in touch with us. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Um, I wish you well. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.